Great, so we're just gonna give everybody a minute to get in and get their audio connected. And then we'll go ahead and get started. All right. I think we're going to go ahead and get started. We have an hour um, and a lot packed in here. So um, I want to respect everybody's time. I'm Jesse Burke. I'm Associate Dean for Education and Faculty in the Department of Behavioral and Community Health Sciences here at Pitt Public Health. And I want to welcome you all to the first in a series of discussions between Pitt Public Health experts about the COVID-19 pandemic. Before we get started, I wanna address some Zoom etiquette. So if you could please turn off your cameras um, and make sure to mute yourself so that we can all hear the speakers. We'll be recording the seminar, so it will be available um, at a later date. So every Friday for the next two months, uh, we'll host a new COVID-19 conversation highlighting the breadth and scope of work being done here at Pitt Public Health. For more information on the series and other COVID-19 efforts, um, I wanna direct you to our COVID-19 school webpage. Uh, for example, next Friday on the 16th, Noble Macero and Tiffany Gary Webb will join Fred Brown from the Forbes Fund to discuss health equity uh, responses to COVID-19 in Allegheny County. So we're trying a new structure for this seminar. Um, following my, in my introduction, the speakers will each present for approximately five to 10 minutes. They'll have a conversation with each other, and then we'll open it up for questions from the audience. When we get to that portion, please use the chat function to ask your question, and I'll help to moderate the discussion. So, a reminder, this is all new, including all the technology, um, so please be patient. I know that the content is very important and, and is of interest to us all. It's now my pleasure to introduce our guest speakers who will discuss the history and the future of COVID-19. Dr. Amy Hartman works at Pitt Center for Vaccine Research and is an assistant professor in the Department of Infectious Disease and Microbiology. Her broad research interests center on understanding the pathogenic mechanisms of RNA viruses, particularly arboviruses. Those are viruses transmitted by insect vectors. The focus of her research is on emerging viruses and those that have the potential for misuse through bioterrorism. Dr. Donald Burke is a professor of epidemiology and the former dean of our Graduate School of Public Health. He's an expert in the prevention, diagnosis, and control of infectious diseases, including HIV AIDS, hepatitis A, avian influenza, and emerging infectious diseases. His research has spanned a wide range of science, including the development of new diagnostics, population-based field studies, clinical vaccine trials, computational modeling of epidemic control strategies, and policy analysis. I'll now turn it over to Dr. Hartman to put the current COVID-19 outbreak in perspective with what we know and what we don't know about the virus. Okay, thank you, Jesse. I'm going to share my screen now. Okay, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'm here today to tell you a little bit about the history of emerging coronavirus outbreaks because I think it's really important to uh, keep the previous outbreaks in mind when we're thinking and hearing a lot about the COVID-19 epidemic that's ongoing. Um, so human coronaviruses, they cause two different types of diseases in people. Most often we know about um, the common cold type of disease and there have been historically four different coronaviruses that cause the common cold. There's another subset of coronaviruses that cause emerging infections such as the one we're experiencing now um, SARS, which stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, MERS for Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, and the ongoing SARS-CoV-2. And they cause different types of disease. So the common cold we're all very familiar with, it's primarily an upper respiratory tract infection that is relatively mild. But the emerging 
uh, infections are a much more severe disease that occur that um, causes systemic symptoms, including high fever, difficulty breathing, and gastrointestinal issues. So if we look at the history of the zoonotic uh, coronaviruses, so zoonotic diseases are diseases that are transmitted from animals to people. So these types of coronaviruses typically reside in bats and then are spread to people via an intermediary species um, such as the camel or the palm civet. And so the original SARS outbreak happened in 2003 and it was very intense but it lasted only a very short period of time and it um, disappeared. The MERS outbreak started in 2012 and is actually still ongoing to this day at a very low level. And then the SARS-CoV-2 outbreak, which is ongoing. So the original, what I call the original SARS outbreaks uh, took place in 2003. And at the time, this was an, an entirely novel disease uh, caused by coronaviruses because historically they've only been known to cause um, mild respiratory illness. But this disease emerged and it was a very severe uh, respiratory syndrome. A lot of the same um, symptoms that you're reading about in the news now, such as shortness of breath, hypoxia, respiratory distress. Uh, the important thing about the original SARS is that it rarely caused subclinical disease. So most of the patients infected with this virus developed disease, developed symptoms, and many of them were very severe. It originated in China, um, about over 8,000 known cases with about a 10% case fatality rate. Another important thing to remember is that um, the majority of people in, um, that developed severe disease were under the age of 60 and were healthy. So these were young, healthy people that were developing really severe disease and many of them died. Um, the outbreak was very short-lived uh, due to um, public health measures that were implemented and it was over within six or eight months. So it caused quite a lot of um, of uh, worldwide uh, panic and disruption and economic disruption. We learned about, a lot about how that original SARS virus was transmitted between people because it is a respiratory infection. Uh, the respiratory secretions are a major route of transmission. It can be transmitted on fomites or inanimate objects. Uh, and airborne transmission, transmission was documented during this outbreak. So the r not or the number of people that uh, one person infects on average was about one to two, but there were these unique cases of super spreaders, which infected many more people. So I have that on the right side of this slide, which is um, a selection of uh, seven of the main super spreaders during the SARS outbreak. So some of these individuals infected, uh, one person infected more than 69 other people. Here's a case where one man infected 143 other people at a hospital. So a lot of these took place at hotels, hospitals, or apartment buildings. And so this um, super spreader phenomenon was very unusual and we still don't really understand the how and why of that. Um, an example of how that happens was shown here in this um, a, a large apartment complex in Hong Kong with 15,000 residents. And this was a documented um, instance of true aerosol and fecal oral transmission of SARS. So a man who was sick with SARS disease came to this apartment complex um, and went into block E. And um, one month later, there were 321 cases and 42 deaths just in this apartment complex. A lot of epidemiology done afterwards showed that um, the virus was uh, spread via um, malfunctioning uh, toilets. So it was basically spread through aerosolized uh, fecal material and it was spread downwind to the other apartment buildings. So this is just an example of how the virus was easily spread during that outbreak. Um, so after the original SARS outbreak went away, another nine years passed um, uh, with no additional coronavirus um, outbreaks. And then along came a new virus in 2012, which was named Middle East Respiratory Syndrome Virus. And at the time, again, it caused um, global uh, health concern because of the experience with the original SARS. But MERS turned out to be quite different. Um, MERS in, in humans often causes subclinical or asymptomatic infection. It can cause very severe lung injury and uh, respiratory distress as well. Um, it originated in Saudi Arabia 
And one of the differences um, is that uh, the individuals who develop severe MERS disease generally have comorbidities and they're generally older. So it's not the young healthy people that are getting very sick, it's the older individuals with um, additional uh, health problems. But we still have MERS cases ongoing now, although at a very low level. And what we know about MERS transmission is that it likely um, uh, came into the human population through camels. So it was a zoonotic transmission event from camels to people. And it, and it has a much lower transmissibility between people compared to the original SARS. So people have to have very close contact with each other in order to get transmission. The r naught for MERS is generally less than one, which is um, why it has not actually become a really widespread outbreak. There have been travel related cases though. It probably originated in bats like the uh, original SARS. So with these two um, original um, uh, zoonotic coronavirus outbreaks in mind, we can, we can better understand what we're hearing in the news and what we're seeing happen with the current SARS-2 outbreak. And before, before we go to our next speaker, um, I wanted to pull up a, a paper that Dr. Burke uh, or a, a book chapter that he published in 1998 on the um, evolution of emerging viruses that come from animals, so zoonotic viruses. Um, and he pointed out at that time that the coronavirus family was a family that we really need to keep our eye on as a potential source of uh, emerging infections. And that is true up until today, um, after SARS and MERS, there have been many studies done showing that um, that uh, SARS-like viruses in bats have the potential for human emergence. And here we are um, today in 2020 in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic. And so if you're not familiar with the Johns Hopkins um, dashboard, uh, a live look at the uh, cases, you should, um, you should uh, check it out because we're up to close to uh, 4 million cases worldwide and over 272 deaths. So what we know about SARS-CoV-2 is, is not very much at this point. We know it spreads very easily between people and it appears that asymptomatic infections play a large role and may hamper the mitigation efforts. We do not really have enough information at this point to, to know what the true case fatality rate is the r not. We really don't know if there are super spreaders like we saw with the original SARS. Um, and we don't know if the virus is shed um, other ways other than the respiratory uh, route. And so my last slide is just to uh, show to you all a direct comparison between uh, the three emerging coronaviruses. Um, and I wanna highlight the main difference. Um, one of the main difference it appears as of now uh, with the SARS-2 outbreak is that asymptomatic or subclinical, subclinically infected patients appear to play a large role in maintaining uh, circulation of the virus. Human to human spread uh, is very efficient as well as it appears to be some capacity for airborne transmission. I'm very cur curious to know and we probably will know in several years time whether super spreaders play a role in this and we also don't know at this point whether uh, what the intermediate animal is between the bat reservoir and humans. So that is a brief history on the emerging coronavirus outbreaks. And I will turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Berg. Thanks, Amy. Um, I'm Don Burke. I was the Dean of the Graduate School of Public Health until about a year ago. Uh, the, today I'm going to be speaking about the future of the COVID-19 epidemic. Amy laid out the past history and I'm going to offer some speculations about what's going to happen. And unfortunately, I do have to call them speculations uh, because predicting the future given the unknowns is going to be very hard. But we need to think about these things and we need to prepare for them. The uh, first paper that appeared um, in the major literature on trying to forecast the epidemic came from the Imperial College group in London 
the MRC Center for Global Infectious Disease Analysis. The head of that is Neil Ferguson. I'm on their scientific advisory board. I know the group well. They're first class. Um, and they put out a, uh, a paper that uh, said that if the epidemic was unrestricted and had the properties that were observed in the early epidemic in China, that there could be as many as 500,000 deaths in the UK and 2.2 million deaths in the United States. Um, and the time course uh, is shown there that there would be upwards of 60,000 deaths per day in the United States. I should point out that the assumptions here were that it would, this was an unconstrained epidemic. They said if no one did anything and given the r naught and given the contact structures, this is what could happen. And I think that that's still a reasonable analysis uh, when you have a virus that's as transmissible as this, what could happen if nothing had been done. The next major model that uh, got national attention came from the Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation in Seattle. Um, and they took a very different approach to what uh, the, uh, the, the MRC group at Imperial did. What they did is they took the existing curve, because by this time we already had data on the course of the epidemic, and did statistical projections of what the course would look like over the future. It's a much safer approach uh, because you're basing it on the historical patterns. And shown here is the trajectory uh, as of today uh, with the confidence intervals around uh, the dotted line, which is the forecast. The current rate is about 2,300, 2,000 deaths per day in the United States, <clears throat> which is much lower than the Imperial uh, Group uh, forecast that could be possible if things were not contained. Uh, the, uh, what's interesting to me about this projection is that it essentially goes down to zero by uh, the end of the summer. Uh, and this, uh, this model generally has been favored by uh, persons who uh, want to have an optimistic look at the epidemic compared to the Ferguson model. So here we have the first uh, two major models, the imperial model, uh, which, which went through the roof, uh, and the IHME model, which is very conservative, and an estimate that's being uh, made in the setting of control, social distancing, lockdown. Um, and uh, but these are very different conditions and with very different conclusions. So our challenge is to say, well, what's going to happen over the, let's just say for the next year, not try to go beyond that. Now we can also talk about longer scenarios as well. So here's our challenge. We've had the, for the spring wave, this is the day of the state, 2,300 deaths uh, uh, per day. We're in early May. Uh, and what is going to happen over the next uh, uh, ensuing months and up to a year. And of course, everybody's asking this from the, uh, the White House task force uh, to every, the person that you, well, you don't meet anybody on the street these days. So there are a number of factors that are going to govern the future trajectory of this COVID epidemic. The first one is the notion of herd immunity. That is uh, when enough people have be, become infected and immune that the population uh, is, itself becomes immune because transmission is blocked. The, the functional r naught drops later uh, below one. Um, currently, there are the studies of how many people have been infected are just being done. There's conflicting results. I think it's safe to say that almost everywhere in the United States, with the possible exception of New York, that the, uh, the, the infection rate so far has been less than 10% and in many places, less than 1%. Uh, my own best guess, and it's only a guess at this point, is that for Allegheny County, we're probably hovering around 1% or a little less. The threshold for protection, uh, that is what level, what number of people will have to be infected for herd immunity to kick in and everybody to not worry about epidemic spread is gonna be at least 50%. 
Uh, so we're well below that epidemic protection threshold. The second factor that's going to govern the future trajectory is the seasonality of the transmission. The endemic coronaviruses, the common cold viruses that that uh, Amy talked about, uh, are sharply seasonal. They go up uh, in every year in November, December, and they come down in January, February, and almost disappear during the summer months. And that's true in al almost every northern hemisphere uh, country. The, uh, the known coronaviruses are sharply seasonal. We don't know that uh, for uh, COVID, uh, for SARS-1, uh, there, it didn't last even a full season, but I, I don't think it's a coincidence that it was eradicated during the summertime, that it appeared in the early spring and, and uh, was eradicated. I think at that, it was that we had the advantage at that time that seasonality in the Northern Hemisphere was helping us. So I, my, uh, I think it's safe to say that we're on a downslope of the transmission of the, uh, the COVID-19 virus, the SARS-CoV-2, uh, but that sometime uh, that during the summer, that the, the transmissibility, the ability of the virus to move from person to person will increase uh, this fall. Um, there have been only one serious estimate in the, uh, uh, the literature so far on trying to estimate the seasonality of the endemic coronaviruses and they don't change a lot. They change by maybe 20 or 30%, but that's enough to make a major difference in the R naught. Uh, so seasonality, we're gonna have to be thinking about uh, in the coming months. The next uh, thing to think about is uh, are what's gonna happen with uh, therapeutics and vaccines. You know, of course, a, a, a vaccine, if available and, wi and widely distributed uh, would uh, change this pattern uh, entirely or a therapeutic uh, that caught people early or even could be used as a uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis uh, like has been done with HIV. Um, that Those could be ways to change the transmission patterns. But I think it's safe to say that uh, there are no game changers on the horizon and it will be um, some, nothing short of a miracle if we have widely available therapeutics or vaccines before the end of the year. So that leaves us with two other factors that are going to govern the future trajectory, the social distancing that we're all experiencing right now and the level of compliance uh, that we, uh, to, to which uh, we, we all uh, participate in social distancing, um, and then um, contact tracing. And those are in some ways the wild cards. These are things we as a society uh, can have some control over uh, and there are widely uh, divergent attitudes about the right way to approach these because of the economic and social disruption uh, of particularly of the social distancing. Um, so let's look at if, what are some of the possible ways these factors will come together you know, over the next few months uh, and, um, and, sh and what will the epidemic look like? So here's one scenario, and I think this is reasonably likely. We had the phase one, uh, the spring wave uh, in the US uh, and that uh, it will, it's on its decline. Uh, I'm optimistic enough that it will continue to decline, but I, uh, I don't think it's gonna go away. I think that we will continue to have this, uh, the, the ebbs and flows during the summertime, uh, particularly since we're already de-distancing or undistancing or opening and uh, so what, how high those uh, bumps are gonna be, how high the local outbreaks are going to be, I, I can't be sure, but they're almost certainly going to occur. My guess is that, uh, that given the seasonality and given the fact that there is ongoing um, social distancing, that the, none of these peaks will achieve what happened in the spring wave, that will, it will stay relatively under control throughout the summer in part because of the seasonality. So what's gonna happen after the, the summertime? Well, one possibility is that we just, you know, it continues along and that, uh, uh, that we have this uh, and, and the continued uh, outbreaks here and there until we get to the point where enough people have been infected 
that herd immunity kicks in. And in some ways, this was the strategy that uh, the UK said they were going to follow initially. Uh, and then when the cases started to mount, they backed away from it. And it's in some ways what Sweden has already been doing. Uh, those countries that have allowed a only a limited social distancing uh, restrictions, uh, where they allow some infection, some it's been referred to as the slow burn strategy for epidemic control. Um, and, I, and that's a possibility uh, that, that will continue. Uh, my own uh, assessment is that I'm very worried this is gonna be the scenario, uh, that we will go through the, uh, the summer ebb uh, and that we will have a combination of things happen, that uh, schools will reopen, social distancing will be uh, uh, cut back, more businesses will, uh, will reopen, in part because we'll be in this summer ebb uh, and things will appear to be under control. Uh, and as we relax the social distancing and confront the increased transmissibility from the seasonality, we could have a significant rebound. The reason I drew this one is even larger than the first one is not uh, to be a scaremonger, but the fact is the spring wave was occurring at a time which was not a natural time for coronaviruses. The coronaviruses are naturally most efficiently transmitted in the November, December, October, I'm sorry, November, December, January. Um, and so I think there's a, a, a reasonable chance that, uh, that the transmission will be enough that we're gonna have to contend with a, uh, a, a, a serious level of transmission. I don't think it'll get that bad because I, now we've learned our lesson to some extent and we're, we'll reinstitute social distancing. So these are the factors uh, that are all gonna come into play. You know, we could, uh, I, I, I didn't go through these mathematically or computationally with models, but we can do that. We can try to quantitate these things. But I, I think just by discussing them and, and having a, an, an appreciation for how they interact with each other uh, and could play out over the next year um, provides just as much information as a, as a computational approach right now. But, uh, so that's, um, that's the future as I see it. The long distance future uh, is that I think there's a reasonable chance that, uh, you know, that this virus is with us to stay, uh, that I'll be very surprised if we can eradicate it from the human species, uh, given the fact that there's a fair amount of asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic disease. That's one of the features that makes a, um, an infectious disease very difficult to eradicate. If you can't recognize the people you know, who are infected, it's hard to find them and uh, prevent additional transmissions. So uh, that uh, the SARS-CoV-2 will be uh, transmitted. And, um, and I don't know whether or not it's going to evolve into a childhood disease um, in, the, um, in the coming decades. And it'll probably take a decade or two to get there. I wouldn't be surprised if it uh, if it becomes the fifth endemic coronavirus uh, only with a little more with a more pathogenesis than some of the others uh, so we can talk about you know, the, you know whether or not any of these uh, speculations on my part are true i'll be interested in your questions and uh, so let's get on with the discussion thank you Great, thank you. So if you could stop sharing your screen. Um, what I would like to have us do is, um, I know you each had a couple questions, maybe you could ask each other and then we can um, begin the chat session. Um, I think for this particular portion, if um, you wanna view it in the speaker view, might be easiest to. Um, so, do you want me to start with a question or do you have one for each other? I have a question for you, Don. Um, uh, what about diagnostic, diagnostic testing? What do you think the role that that is going to have in controlling the outbreak? And by diagnostic testing, I mean both the uh, PCR-based test to diagnose uh, active cases as well as an antibody test to tell whether people have been exposed or have been infected. 
Yeah, so uh, both are going to be essential to having a, a coherent uh, national response and international response to the epidemic. The, uh, um, I, I hope it could even go further than that, is that not only a yes-no diagnosis, but can we uh, use the PCR to identify who has the most virus, who are the most likely transmitters? There's a lot of things that we don't know yet about who infects whom. You know, those are the classic questions in epidemiology of who infects whom and why. Why are some people susceptible? Why are some people uh, transmitters? And the diagnostic tests can help us with the yes, no's, but they may also be able to help us with these questions of transmitter um, and the, uh, uh, the susceptibility. Uh, they're going to be critical uh, that uh, you know, if, if there's going to be a, tr a trade off between um, loosening of social distancing versus uh, diagnostic assays. And if we uh, uh, and, and, and if we loosen the, uh, the, the social distancing, we're going to have to do more contact tracing. We're going to have to be even more rigorous. Um, one of the problems with, um, with this disease is that people have the, apparently have the most virus from the onset of symptoms. That's when they have the, the, uh, the and, it, and that the implication of that is that they have the most viruses in their respiratory secretions even before their onset of symptoms, uh, which means that if you do symptomatic diagnostics, waiting for somebody to get sick, you're gonna miss an awful lot of people. And so we have to do the diagnostics and we have to do diagnostics on people who are asymptomatic. We have to change our frame of case detection to include asymptomatic um, uh, PCR positives. Uh, the antibody tests are, uh, are, are you know is, is a controversial area right now. There are lots of uh, preliminary reports out. There have been some terrible reports, terrible meaning, I mean, scientifically not well controlled tests with you know, high false positive rates and, and, and difficult to interpret. Um, and, uh, uh, but have, if we have those, then that'll give us a much better insight as to what proportion of the population has been infected and hopefully immune. Um, the presence of antibodies doesn't guarantee immunity, but my own view is I'll be surprised if that in the short term that uh, ant positive antibodies doesn't signify some level of immunity after somebody's been infected. Maybe after 10 years, then that immunity wanes, but I'll, but I, I'll be surprised if, if there's not immunity. That would be uncharacteristic. The endemic coronavirus is immunity wanes. People do get susceptible, but that takes years. Right. And so I expect that same thing to happen. So, so do you think it is, given your model of um, uh, the outbreak subsiding over the summer, do you think it is wise to start on a limited basis opening things up uh, during the summer months with the idea that we're probably going to have to maybe close things back up again in the fall or winter? Is that, is that um, how, you, how you think about it? Yeah, that is how I think about it. I, wor I worry that uh, oh, did we lose him? I think he's cutting out on my society to to rat. Sorry. Oh, you're back. Okay, you cut out for a minute. <laughs> Okay. The, uh, okay. Concerned about that, that we will have this false sense of security, and then things could get. All right. So I think, not surprisingly, we're having technical problems um, with his connection. Um, while we wait for him to get back. Um, Amy, I was going to ask you um, a question about um, the scientific community's response to um, this um, SARS-2. Has it changed since the original SARS outbreak? Um, if you can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, um, so it's been amazing. So 17 years since the original outbreak, almost 20 years, so much has changed 
in science. The advances um, even from that time are amazing. So with the original SARS outbreak, it took five months from when the first case was alerted to the WHO until the genomic sequence of the virus was obtained, five months. For the SARS-2 COVID-19, it took two weeks. So the speed at which the, um, the science is moving, the speed at which the data is coming out, um, the scientific enterprise itself is very different now than it was then. Now we have things called preprints, which is basically releasing scientific data and scientific manuscripts um, online prior to peer review that did not exist in 2003. So we have a lot more information out there and it's um, harder to sort through what is the good information, what's the good reliable data from um, everything that isn't as reliable. So we have to sort through that. And then the other aspect that um, is happening now that we didn't have to contend with in 2003 was social media, right? So um, many of us have, have spent a lot of time this week um, uh, with dealing with conspiracy theories and trying to, um, you know, trying to put out valid scientific uh, reasoning and underpinnings for what we know and don't know about this virus. And so that adds an extra element, um, but science has really changed quite a lot in 17 years. Well, I'm, I apologize, I, my, uh, my internet connection cut out for a second, now I'm back. The, uh, so I have a question uh, for Amy, uh, that uh, you work uh, with uh, animal models uh, uh, quite a bit. Um, that, uh, uh, are there any ways to understand the, the uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, with animal models? Are there ways that we can understand the, some of the, how it causes diseases or, uh, or how it's transmitted? Uh, tell us a little bit about what your work is on that. Sure, yes. So uh, one of the main ways that we study um, infectious diseases um, and how they cause disease and how they're spread is using animal models because uh, there's many types of experiments that we can't do with people, so we do them with animal models instead. One of the um, hurdles to overcome with a coronavirus like SARS-2 is that um, the virus itself uses a very specific uh, protein receptor to enter human cells. And so uh, this receptor is called ACE2. It's found on human cells. It is not found um, on the cells of mice, for instance instance. So the SARS-2 virus does not infect mice and you can't use mice as a model. Um, there are a number of experimental ways to get around that, such as transgenic mice that express the human ACE2 receptor, uh, but we also use additional um, other species of animals. So ferrets are a good model. Um, ferrets are a model that's often used for influenza because their respiratory tract is um, more similar to humans than in other animals. So uh, SARS-2 does infect ferrets, and ferrets, I think, are going to be an important animal model for modeling transmission of SARS-2 between animals. Um, there, we also use non-human primates or monkeys um, as a model um, because they're uh, more closely related to humans. Um, and so uh, regardless of which type of animal are used for these studies, the, the studies are tend to be difficult to do and time consuming, um, requiring um, high containment at this, at this point. Uh, but it is the, the most reliable way we have right now to really study the pathogenic mechanisms and the transmission mechanisms. That's great. So I'm gonna jump in here because our chat <laughs> questions are um, building up. Um, and the first one is if we could ask Dr. Burke to return to the question that he was answering before his internet cut out, um, the question of uh, what to do in the fall, I think was what you were talking about. Yeah, so, uh, so the, the, uh, what is the probability that we're going to get a fall wave? Well, we need to be prepared for a fall wave. I think that's part of the, the major point. We should not assume that things will go well. Uh, that we need to uh, the, learn the lessons from our first go round. Uh, uh, that we need to be prepared when it comes to uh, hospital beds and ventilators and uh, personnel and PPE and uh, and all of those things. 
But there's also going to be other things that we can prepare for is that, that there's a good chance this will hit right at the same, exactly the same time as the flu season hits. And so we're going to need to be able to diagnose which ones are COVID and which ones are flu. Uh, that uh, so one way to do that would be have rapid diagnostic tests for flu so you don't have to wait you know, for a for test to come back for a given patient. Uh, so uh, uh, and and I think we we also are going to have to be ready. Uh, to reinstitute the social distancing, even if that's uh, however unpalatable that is, by talking about it ahead of time and saying, this is a risk, we need to make a plan as to how we're going to do it. If the cases go above level X, what are we going to do? It's going to be the opposite of the, the careful undistancing. We're going to have to have a plan for the redistancing. So I, I think there are things we can do to plan uh, if it turns out that way. Great, thank you. So um, another question that we have here is how confident are you about the seasonality of the COVID disease? Perhaps. I, I'm about as confident about that as I have everything else. Uh, the, uh, that's a joke in saying that I, I don't know for sure and I uh, presented it. But I do know that the seasonal, uh, that the endemic coronaviruses are all sharply seasonal uh, and and I also know that almost every other virus disease transmitted by the respiratory route is sharply seasonal. Uh, and uh, so I, it could be that this one is not, that this one is being transmitted some other way and that, uh, that, and that it isn't seasonal. So I'm, I, I, will, I will bet bottom dollar that it's seasonal. The problem is what's the amplitude of that seasonality? Uh, and how do we estimate that? And I uh, and right now in, in the so we 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 have our models right now, and we're trying to say how much seasonality should we build into this for forecasting the future? And right now, what we do is we put in twenty to thirty percent uh, change over time. The way that gets represented is that the uh, the uh, the transmission is maximal um, at the uh, at the, uh, the 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 winter December twenty first the uh, the winter solstice and it's uh, and then it uh, peak uh, it peaks uh, at that time and then drops during the uh, spring and then is uh, hits a minimum at the uh, summer solstice and that uh, and that the the change in the amplitude uh, of that goes about thirty percent of the R naught or thereabout. So it's not a major major factor, but it's enough uh, that uh, it can make a big difference in your how much social distancing you need. And John, do you think that the seasonality is why maybe we're not seeing as much spread in um, tropical climates as we are like here in temperate climates? Yeah, so that um, um, that's the same that happens with flu. Flu can be transmitted in tropical climates. It just tends to be uh, spread out over the year a lot more than it is here. So that, uh, uh, that it, yeah, it probably has less of a seasonal driver. Uh, the uh, you know the, the other problems are that uh, that uh, many of the tropical countries have younger populations. They have a lot less obesity than we do uh, in many countries. Uh, uh, there may be other factors that are you know not just the uh, you know, the effect of weather and climate, but uh, but yes, it's a it's different there, and I think that's probably true. I also think, yeah, you know, there's a good chance both New Zealand and uh, Australia have done very well uh, with this epidemic, uh, uh, and uh, and I wouldn't be surprised if they, they've had a little boost because their epidemic happened to come, you know, toward the uh, end of their summer uh, rather than toward the beginning of the. Uh, so I, I, I they've done a great job, and I don't want to detract uh, from that, but. So just keep that in mind when you look at the, uh, the, the risk profiles. So another question that's here is, uh, how does the first SARS virus differ genetically from the SARS-CoV-2? And specifically, is there any reason to think that the SARS-CoV-2 might have escaped from a lab? I know that's gotten a lot of attention and maybe we can start with Amy if you wanna respond to that. Sure, that's a good question. Um, so the, the SARS-CoV-2 
is, uh, differs from the original SARS by about a thousand nucleotides. So there's a, about a thousand, give or take, uh, changes in the genome of the new virus compared to the one from 2003. Now, um, uh, the reason that it's named SARS-CoV-2 is because if you look at the genetic sequence and if you do a phylogenetic analysis of all of the known coronavirus sequences, um, the, this new virus falls uh, in, in a location that makes it more closely related to the original SARS than to, say, MERS or any of the other human coronaviruses. That does not mean that they are the same virus they are just more closely related. And um, there was a bit of controversy when the virus was named SARS-CoV-2. And I, uh, in, in some respects, I wish they hadn't named it that because it makes it sound like it's the same thing. It's not, it's a different virus. It differs by quite a bit. Uh, a thousand nucleotides is, is uh, a fair amount. Um, and at this point, there is no evidence that um, the virus uh, came from an es escape from a lab. So, uh, if the genetic sequence of this virus exactly matched the original SARS, then you could hypothesize that it came from um, a lab that was maintained, say, in a lab freezer for 17 years. But that's not the case. RNA viruses change and evolve as they, as they grow in organisms and in people. And so the, the nucleotide changes that we're seeing um, uh, reflect that. I um, just point out that I'm going to ar argue with you here a little bit, Amy, that uh, on the terminology, folio one, two, and three differ by substantially more than three percent, and uh, you know, and uh, so there are a lot of other and dengue's one, two, uh, three, and four all differ from each other by more than that. So I, it's in the right ballpark. <laughs> all right. So another thank you. Another question is um, asking for some clarification. So. Uh, we've heard that we are both waiting for herd immunity and that immunity conferred may not be strong and may not be long lasting. Um, this seems contradictory. Uh, can you comment on this? Do you want to comment, Amy, or shall I? Uh, you can take that one. Okay. The, uh, uh, so I, 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 I didn't really say that the, the, the immunity was so short-lived as to not be important over the next year or two. In fact, I took pains to say that I thought that it was important over the next year or two. Uh, but I, usually, I could be wrong. Uh, and there, uh, there, there, there's, you know, there's some evidence that the virus can infect some of the, you know, the, the, the B memory cells and that it may change the immune profile, that there's a a possible hint of an immunodeficiency syndrome that goes with the, the disease, those things could come into play. Uh, but my own suspicion is that it will be that uh, a person is unlikely to become uh, immediately susceptible again at normal levels, uh, and that if they do become susceptible, that can happen, but it'll probably take 5, 10, 20 years for that to happen. So I don't see that as being particularly incompatible with the notion of herd immunity. Great, thank you. So here's um, a good one. <laughs> What's your rating of the federal Trump administration pandemic response to date? That's definitely yours, Amy. <laughs> um, I, I really wish there was a cohesive uh, national strategy for testing, for, for launching diagnostic testing in um, an appropriate manner. That has sort of been left to individual companies and individual states and ind individual entities, but I, I, I feel like we need a national strategy for diagnostics. Um, I do think we also need uh, a national strategy for social distancing, like one of the questions I see in the chat is, you know, should the d social distancing strategy be um, localized versus universal? Like right now we pretty much have a universal social distancing strategy. Can we move to a more localized one? The answer is probably yes. These are the types of things I kind of wish we had some national leadership uh, on, um, on pulling together experts and brainstorming on the best way to handle this. That's where I think we're, we're, we're missing. Okay. 
Uh, I will. I'll also take that on. And uh, the uh, so I, I, I of the physicians who are on the uh, uh, the uh, uh, the COVID task force. I know Tony Fauci pretty well. We worked together. We even co-authored a paper years ago together. Uh, Debbie Works uh, used to work uh, for me in the Army when I was at Walter Reed. So did Bob Redfield. The three of us were had published several papers together. So I know these people, um, and I know they're all smart and and dedicated and uh, compassionate, and they've got uh, I think all of the right stuff. I think they're in an impossible job now. I think they're in an administration that doesn't value the input of scientific information, that is quick to make decisions that are not evidence-based. And that's a very, very difficult position for them to be in. Uh, so the consequence of all of that is that our national strategy is, is far from what it should be. Uh, that we, uh, we reacted slowly, uh, we reacted in an uncoordinated way, uh, and we're still reacting in an uncoordinated way. Uh, so we've got a long way to go. I, I don't envy uh, uh, Tony Fauci and Debbie Burks and Bob Redfield um, in trying to provide what is a sensible national strategy. Uh, it's, a it's a tough uphill uh, for, for all three of them. Um, if they, there's been some talk about uh, revamping the, uh, uh, the, the uh, COVID uh, task force. And uh, initially the discussion was about um, changing it so that it was more economic uh, uh, looking, but enough people push back that I that they're going to retain it, and maybe now they'll add um, some other players that uh, that have uh, that can provide political counterbalance. I hope. Great, thank you. Um, so, uh, a question here about contact tracing. Um, and how that works with uh, the fact that so many people are asymptomatic. If you could just talk a little bit more about that, that would be great. Yeah, so the way uh, contact tracing works is that a, a person is identified as being um, positive. Uh, they are asked uh, for their uh, contacts uh, uh, for uh, the uh, period of time. They uh, Those contacts are th then notified, they are told to uh, isolate themselves for 14 days uh, uh, and, um, and it's a voluntary system. The, uh, so from the point of view of uh, the, uh, it does take people who are contacts, even regardless of their symptoms, and advise them to self-quarantine. So that means that they are, they won't be transmitting during that time. Um, and if they get symptoms, they're supposed to get tested is the way that it goes. But regardless, they're supposed to be in um, a quarantine for 14 days. Uh, the, uh, so I think that, the, that, uh, that it, 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 if, if your purpose of, the, if you're looking at the contact side, that probably works okay. If you're looking at how you detect people in the first place, uh, based on symptoms, we're missing lots and lots of people. If your your index of suspicion is based on these clinical syndromes, you know, my guess is that you're we're missing seventy percent of the. You know, we're only catching thirty percent of the people, uh, rather than uh, the majority. So, so how you find people in the first place? Once you get your contact tracing going and, and are identifying people early before they. Uh, are transmitting, then I think you can, uh, then you can interrupt it. But if you're relying on case detection based on symptoms, then we're in trouble. Great, thank you. Another question here, and um, I've heard some discussion of this uh, myself. So I know several otherwise healthy people who were diagnosed with pneumonia in late November and early January. They had similar symptoms to COVID. Is there any possibility that this virus was really here much earlier? Um, want to comment on that? Maybe Dr. Hartman, we can start with you. Uh, I can't really comment on that. Don, do you have a, a good answer for that? All I can say is that I, I know of several groups that have been actively looking for um, 
uh, COVID, the uh, SARS-CoV-2 in specimens from people who had respiratory illnesses before, Mar say, March 1st, uh, um, and they are not finding them. You know, it doesn't mean that there weren't some cases that were imported here and there, uh, but in part, earlier I said that I thought that our total infection rate was still less than 1% or 1% in Allegheny County. And that's based on the observation that we, nobody has been able to come up with an earlier diagnostic case. Now, is it possible? Sure, it's possible. And I have to say, I've gotten lots of emails from people with exactly that same story that I, you know, that I, did I have it or not? I should also add uh, that uh, that if you do a careful analysis of patients uh, who have either COVID or influenza, the overlap you, you cannot on a given patient tell at all uh, whether or not they uh, for any given uh, symptom, even the issues of loss of taste or uh, so those are not you know, th those are not perfectly they're not even close to perfectly predictive of who's and in, who's a COVID versus who's a uh, influenza. So I, uh, I think it's unlikely. I think it's possible that there were cases imported here and there, but I, I'm not persuaded that there has been any significant transmission uh, um, before February in, in, um, particularly in our part of the, our part of the country. So we are about out of time. Um, I know we haven't had a chance to answer all of the questions, um, but what we'll do is follow up with you both um, with the questions that were in the chat um, and post those responses on our COVID-19 web page. Um, as we wrap up, um, do you have any concluding remarks um, that you want to share with our viewers? No, I think I'm glad you're doing this as a as a full uh, series. You know, that um, uh, I'm as a as a um, epidemiologist, I'm frustrated how little we know about who infects whom at this stage of the epidemic. Uh, that and until we know that better about what are the transmitting properties of how much viral load counts, how much uh, symptoms count, uh, how much age counts. Uh, um, so how much socioeconomics can, uh, you know, we're still going to be f flying in part blind. Uh, so we've got our work cut out for us. Um, just my last comment is that I think that, that this pandemic is going to change how our society operates in some profound ways, um, all of which we can't really predict. But I think the way we interact with each other on a personal basis um, is going to change. I think a lot of um, structures that we that we have in place will be different going forward. But I, I'm confident that we will, uh, you know, find a way to get beyond this and go back to some semblance of normality. Although it'll be different than what I think we've been used to in the past. Well, I really appreciate you both um, spending the time with us um, to share your expertise and to talk to us about um, many of the issues and the questions that we all have. Um, we will continue this series and it will be hosted every Friday um, at four o'clock. Um, and again, uh, more information of it is available about this series and about the scope of COVID-19 research that we're doing at Pitt Public Health if you go to our main web page um, and that's where we will also post um, additional resp or responses to the questions that we didn't get to in the chat. Um, so I really appreciate everybody taking the time to join us and I hope um, that I will hear and see you all um, again next Friday. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Don. Hey, thanks, Amy. Bye.